What do you think eternity is going to be like? I hope you have dreams and thoughts about it, and I hope that it's something that's uh, not terrifying, but something very, very special, because that's the way the Bible uh, describes eternity. And we are at Revelation chapter 21, not far to go yet. And it talks about the new heaven and the new earth that God is creating. This old world is going to be refashioned. We pick it up in Revelation chapter 21 in verse 1. John writes, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And there was no longer any sea. Now that's an interesting thing. Um, it's kind of going to disappoint me because I like fishing and boating and things like that. It doesn't mean there won't be any sea, that what will happen is there'll still be water and rivers and tributaries and things, but things are a little bit different uh, in this refashioning. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. So the new Jerusalem, part of this new heaven and new earth after the millennial kingdom, is sort of like, the best way you could describe it is a hover city. It just kind of comes down from heaven. Now, this is supernatural stuff. This is science fiction, strange stuff. But when God says it's going to happen, then you can know that it's going to happen. And he says, here's this, and we'll get to the dimensions of this new city uh, in, a, in a bit. But coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. Now, this is not the old Jerusalem. This is not the Jerusalem that... Um, that had the temple in it uh, during the millennial reign. Ezekiel talks about the millennial temple. Uh, it's a physical city on earth where Jerusalem is right now. This is a totally new thing, and you're going to find out there's no temple uh, in this new Jerusalem because there's no need for a temple, and John explains that in a little bit. Now, I want to go back because this concept of a new heaven and a new earth is not just restricted to the New Testament. Uh, the Old Testament, there are predictions uh, in Isaiah about the new heaven and the new earth. In Isaiah chapter 65, now you've got to remember, the book of Isaiah has 66 chapters in it. The first 39, now this is an amazing thing because editors did this. This is not part of God's inspiration. But the first 39 chapters deal with the woe and the sorrow of the nation of Israel, God punishing the nation of Israel uh, for their waywardness and their disbelief. And it's interesting because the first 39 chapters of Isaiah parallel the first basically 39 books of the Old Testament. Then there are 27 chapters, which kind of sounds like the New Testament, uh, in Isaiah up to chapter 66, and they are the glory days. This is all about this new kingdom, the millennial kingdom, the new heavens, the new earth, and all that God is doing, and he does it through uh, the prophecy of Isaiah. So in Isaiah chapter 65 and verse 17, Isaiah writes, see, I will create new heavens and a new earth. God is saying that he's going to do this. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. This is encouragement for God's people because they had been through such difficult times. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create, for I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people a joy. Has that ever happened in history? I mean, you might enjoy going to Jerusalem, but it's not, I mean, it's just like any other city. Uh, and there's strife and there's tension and there's difficulty and, and you couldn't exactly say that the people are uh, a, a joy at every stage of uh, life. So it's something for the future. Verse 19, I will rejoice over Jerusalem and take delight in my people. The sound of weeping and of crying will be heard in it no more. So Jerusalem at this future point uh, there's, there's no sorrow, there's no weeping, there's no crying. So we know that he's talking about the new Jerusalem and the new heaven and the new earth. If you go to the last chapter, chapter 66 in the book of Isaiah, beginning with verse 22, he repeats some of this. As the new heavens and the new earth 
that I made will endure before me, declares the Lord, so will your name and descendants endure, meaning the, the, the children of Israel. From one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another, all mankind will come and bow down before me, says the Lord. So that's a future time, new heaven and new earth. The Bible Knowledge Commentary, Dr. Walvoord says it this way, in these verses, the Lord described the millennial kingdom back in Isaiah, which is seemingly identified here with the eternal state, the new heavens and the new earth. Now, what happened with Isaiah is he didn't see the difference. It's not that he didn't know the difference, but he blended it all together. So we went from uh, the millennial kingdom, thousand year reign of Christ, right into the new heaven and the new earth, which is what is confirmed by Revelation chapter 21. In Revelation, however, the new heavens and the new earth follow the millennium. Revelation chapter 20, verse 4, talks about the millennium, the thousand year reign of Christ. Most likely, Isaiah did not distinguish between these two aspects of God's rule. He saw them together as one. After all, the millennium, though a thousand years in duration, will be a mere pinpoint of time compared with the eternal state, with the new heaven and the new earth. When we come back to the book of Revelation, John tells us that it's the end of death and dying and pain. This is a passage I often use in funeral services because it gives hope about eternity and the new heavens and the new earth. Revelation chapter 21, verse 3. John says, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. Great hope. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. Why? For the old order of things has passed away. In other words, in the new heaven and the new earth, there is not such a thing as death and crying and pain, and particularly in the new Jerusalem. Verse 5. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. It's a brand new world. It's a brand new beginning. Now remember, this takes place after the millennial kingdom. It takes place after a lot of battles, after the rebellion of Satan, Satan being cast into the abyss, Satan being locked down for a thousand years, and then Satan uh, being cast with others into the lake of fire, and God begins everything over new. Then he says, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. So it's the end of pain, etc., etc. And so he describes a new ending, a new beginning, and also a spiritual time of quenching thirst in the book of Revelation. Pick it up in verse 6. He said to me, it is done. And then Christ is saying this, I am the Alpha and the Omega. What's the Alpha and the Omega? <laughs> What is it? The beginning and the end. How do you know it's the beginning and the end? Because it says it's the beginning and the end, right? It's the first and last letter of the Greek alphabet. Okay, it is Alpha the first, Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta, uh, and Omega is the last letter. It's like from A to Z for our alphabet. So he says, I am all in all. That's what he's saying. By the beginning and the ending, the Alpha and the Omega, and he says to the thirsty, I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Now he's talking about spiritual thirst. He's not talking about physical thirst. And he says those who are victorious will inherit all of this. What? The new heavens, the new earth, this new beginning, um, a, a quenching of your spiritual thirst. And he says, and I will be their God and they will be my children. So let's see who he's talking about with this. He begins to contrast those who have trusted Christ and are in this new heaven and new earth with those who reject Christ basically by their lifestyle. Pick it up in verse 8 of Revelation 21. He says, okay, all of those that are here are quenching their thirst, but by contrast, the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, idolaters, and all liars, 
they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. And he says, this is the second death. He did it at the end of chapter 20 as well. Now, let me ask you a question. Have you ever been cowardly? I, I feel like it's, um, um, you know, follow the Yellow Brook Road and the Wizard of Oz, you know? Uh, everybody has been cowardly at times. So is he saying if you were cowardly once in your life, you're excluded from the kingdom? Have you ever been unbelieving? Have you ever, you know, not been able to exercise faith and been through a tough time? Vile, made the wrong choices, maybe not a murderer, maybe not sexually immoral, but those who pra practice magic arts, idolaters, have you ever lied? Of course, everyone has. So he can't be talking about, you know, behavior alone. He's saying these are people who have rejected Christ by their lifestyle and they remain faithless, therefore cowardly. They remain unbelieving. They remain in the practices and they don't want to change their lifestyle. There are those who don't want anything to do with faith or religion. And so he's not talking about believers. So because believers... Many of them had the same lifestyle. Think about John Newton, who was a, a, a famous believer, wrote a lot of our hymns, uh, and um, he was a slave trader, okay? He owned other people. Uh, he, he practiced a lot of immorality. There, were, there have been others who have come to Christ, but because Christ has changed their lifestyle, they move from being idolaters and liars and immoral and unbelieving and cowardly to being believers in Jesus Christ. And that's who he's talking about. He's talking about those who have rejected Christ and continue to reject Christ all their lives by their lifestyle, all right? Now, you don't get in or out of heaven based on your behavior, but your behavior demonstrates your belief. Your behavior demonstrates, you know, how you feel about Christ, whether you accept or reject him. And so that's what John is saying there. And so then he talks about the New Jerusalem, and he calls the New Jerusalem um, the place where the bride of the Lamb is. You're going to see something interesting here. Who's the bride of the Lamb? Believers. Believers, but not just believers. More specifically, in the New Testament, I mean, Israel is called also the, the bride of God. There's always that illustration that Israel is married uh, to God. But even more specifically, the church of Jesus Christ is known as the bride of the Lamb or the bride of Christ. In verse 9 of chapter 21, one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues, you remember that? Um, towards chapter 18 and 19, uh, came and said to me, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. So you're going to find out what the bride, what the church is doing in this new heaven and new earth and new Jerusalem. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city. What's the holy city? Definitely not Washington, D.C. or New York City or Los Angeles or any of those. The holy city is Jerusalem. And he explains it there. But look at this Jerusalem. Again, it's a hovercraft city. I, I love this concept. Coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God, and its brilliance was like that of, very precious, of a very precious jewel, like jasper, clear as crystal. So this is some magnificent, real city that somehow comes down from heaven. And he goes on and he describes it. Verse 12, it had great high wall, a great high wall with 12 gates and with 12 angels at the gates. And on the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. That often happened. So who's in this city? The gates of the city are reminiscent of the 12 tribes of Israel, their names, Reuben, Manasseh, whatever, you know, Judah, whatever, they're on the gates. There were three gates on the east, 
three on the north, three on the south, and three on the west. I tried to find an artist's rendering of this that would even come close, and I, and I rejected the idea because they were all like really phony looking. Uh, I, I'm sorry, it's just hard to express this. The wall of the city then had 12 foundations. So there's these 12 gates with the names of the tribes of Israel on them, and the wall of the city with 12 foundations on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Why? Because they represent the church. So in this new city, as far as residents, you have representation of ancient Israel and representation of the church for the last 2,000 years that God has uh, called the bride of the Lamb or the bride of Christ. They continue to talk about this hovercraft New Jerusalem. And what's very interesting is the size of the New Jerusalem. Those of you who have been to Jerusalem, it's not a super big city. It's not as big as New York City, but it's, it's an interesting Middle Eastern typical city. This thing will blow you away. Verse 15 of chapter 21. The angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, its gates and its walls. The city was laid out like a square. So it's, it's actually like a cube or perhaps a pyramid. We'll get to that. As long as it was wide, he measured the city with the rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length. Now you all know how long that is, right? Guess what? That's between 1,400 and 1,500 miles. Miles. It's a square, it's a cube, it's a square that runs 14, 1,500 miles this way and then 14 or 1,500 miles that way. I'll show you a comparison in a minute. As wide and high as it is long, incidentally it goes up. The angel measured the wall using human measurement, and it was 144 cubits thick. The wall around it was about 200 and some, maybe 213 feet wide. It was about as thick, as wide, as three quarters of a football field, about 75 yards. So that is, you could, you could run chariots on the top of that. You could, you could run around the walls of the of the city so it is a massive massive city but you'd have to run for 14 or 1500 miles actually farther than that if you went all around the city now here's what i want you to see someone on the internet has taken this and drawn out with a marker a 14 to 1500 foot block and I want you to see, if you can, if you plop it down, hover over, and come down on the earth where Jerusalem is, it's going to take in Egypt. Do you see why it says there'll be no sea? Because it would be covering the Mediterranean Sea. It would be up here by the Caspian Sea, Black Sea, that whole area, all the way over to Babylon in Iraq all the way down into Arabia, down into Egypt. It is massive. I'll show you another way to look at it. If you superimpose this city on the United States, you'd split it right down the middle. You could put it either in the eastern half, the eastern half, of the United States, and it would go all the way over uh, to places like Nebraska and other, and other places, or you could go from California back. Another way to look at it is if you started out up by Buffalo, New York, not far from Ottawa, Canada, measure 1,500 miles, you'd be the city would be right, stretch all the way to Montana. And if you went north to south, 
it'd be from around Buffalo up there in New York, north of Boston, all the way to Miami. That would be the footprint in the current United, now it's not gonna be in the United States, it's gonna be in, in Israel hovering over there. That is a massive, massive city. Hard to even imagine. Either this is the biggest myth uh, or, or God is the biggest miracle worker in the world. This just, just amazes me, just amazes me. How'd you like to buy real estate in that area? Start to invest now, see how it, see how it goes. All right, Bible knowledge commentary again. Commentators differ as to whether the city is a cube, it's got the base that's a square, or if it runs up like a pyramid. We don't know. There's no real evidence. The description seems to favor the pyramid according to what Walford says. Verse 18, the wall was made. Now here's the description of this 1,500 mile square block city. The wall was made of jasper and the city of pure gold as pure as glass. Now this is what this is what the impression is that John is seeing. It's interesting that the angel measures it because John would not have any idea unless he was told it was 1500 miles. I mean, you couldn't look at that and guess it in perspective, and that's one of the reasons that angel has that golden rod and measures it. The foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation, now remember, what does the foundation stand for? The 12 apostles, all right? The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth ruby. So these are layers of colors. Pretty amazing. The seventh, chrysolite, the eighth, beryl, the ninth, topaz, the tenth, turquoise, the eleventh, jacinth, the twelfth, amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls. Now this is where the names of the tribes are. Each gate made of a single pearl. That's one big pearl. The great street of the city was of gold as pure as transparent glass. Again, the Bible Knowledge Commentary says this, the decorations of the foundation with the apostles' names inscribed on them include 12 stones involving different colors. The color of the jasper was not indicated. The sapphire was probably blue. The chalcedony comes from Chalcedon, Turkey and is basically blue with stripes of other colors. The emerald is a bright green. The sardonyx is red and white, and the carnelian, called a sardis in the NASB, is usually ruby red in color, though it sometimes has an amber or honey color. It's like a rainbow foundation. This is all stuff you're gonna see, it's amazing. He continues, in the carnelian stone in ver chapter 4 and verse 3 is coupled with the jasper to reflect the glory of God. The crystallite is a golden color, probably different from the modern crystallite stone, which is a pale green. The beryl is a sea green. The topaz is a transparent yellow green. The crystophrase is also green. The jacinth uh, is violet in color, and the amethyst is purple. The stones together provide a brilliant array of beautiful colors, the gates resemble huge single pearls, and the streets of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. That is amazing. But there's something that's missing in the New Jerusalem. And we will be done with the need for a temple. John describes this. Remember, in Jerusalem, during the millennium, there will be a temple. Ezekiel said there will be memorial offerings to honor uh, the death and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. But when we get to this point in the New Jerusalem, verse 22 says, I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it. Does it say they're not there? We don't know how this is all remade, but they're not necessary. That's the whole point. For the glory of God gives its light, 
and the Lamb is its lamp. So the brilliance of God, the glory of God, and the glory of Jesus Christ is what supplies the light. The New Jerusalem is a place also for believers only. Old Testament believers, New Testament believers, church believers, everyone who has trusted Christ and trusted in the Old Testament their Messiah. Verse 24, the nations will walk by its light and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. I don't totally understand that, but you can live inside the city and you can live outside the city because there are other parts of the earth. But look what he says, on no day will its gates ever be shut for there will be no night there the glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those who na whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So we don't know if there are somehow eternal unbelievers outside, because I thought they were cast into the lake of fire. Um, but it, it, it's interesting, and maybe he's just using this as representative language that says, you know what, if you're in the New Jerusalem, it's because you're a believer and it's for believers only. And God has dealt with all the rest of the evil in the world. I think that's the interpretation, but we're going to have to stay tuned until we get there. But only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. It is interesting, the Bible Knowledge Commentary once again says, that in the six references to the book of life in Revelation, only this one calls it the Lamb's book of life. Now, I don't know what the significance is of it, but we're talking about people like you and I who have trusted Christ as their savior. I wanna share just in closing, because there are other places in the scripture that talk about how the world will end. Do you remember what the promise is back in Genesis 5 and 6 about the, how the world will not end? It will never end again by a flood. Remember, God gave the rainbow. He promised he'd never do that again. And it will end by fire. How will the world begin again from the other writers of Scripture? Well, there are two major. One is 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10. And it fits with Revelation. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. This is this new heaven, new earth. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. It's one of the reasons that we'll no longer have a sea or a major sea. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be. You know what the implication is? Don't dig your roots too heavily into planet Earth because God is going to refashion it. You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God. And look at this little expression, and speed its coming. How do we speed the coming of the new heaven and the new Earth? by holy living, by being faithful to our God, by sharing Jesus Christ with those, because one day the very last person is going to be added to the body of Christ and then God's gonna wrap it all up. And we don't know who that person is, we don't know where in the world they are, but that's part of our commission. It continues in chapter three, Second Peter, verse 12. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. And you can conjecture as an asteroid what's going to, to happen. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to what? This is what fits with Revelation. A new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. After the millennium. Hebrews chapter 12 also says the same kind of thing in verse 22 it says but you have come to Mount Zion to the holy city to the city of the living God the heavenly Jerusalem now this is before the, the writer of the Hebrews wrote this and he wrote it in contrast about coming to Jesus Christ 
And if you read the passage before this in chapter 12, it talks about how people came to a terrible mountain, Mount Sinai, how fearful it was because the presence of God was there. You should go back and read the early part of Hebrews chapter 12. How fearful it was, how Moses had to cover his face because the glory was fading, and how nothing, no animal, nothing could touch this holy mountain, Mount Sinai. Otherwise, you'd be killed. And he says in the passage before this, he says, it's not like you're coming to that kind of fearful, terrible mountain where nothing could touch it or there'd be instant death because of the holiness of God. But he says, instead, you've come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem, so that you and I, when we come to Christ, in a sense, come to the heavenly Jerusalem before it's even there. He says, you have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly. That's that new heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem. To the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Remember, the blood of Abel cried out against Cain. See to it, therefore, that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? At that time, his voice shook the earth. When did that happen? Mount Sinai. I mean, there was fire on the mountain. There was, brim there was all kinds of fearful stuff. And he said, if, if they were warned from earth, here we are being warned from heaven, it ought to be that much more majestic and we ought to take heed. Pick it up in verse 26. But now he, meaning God, has promised, once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. I'm going to refashion it. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken. That is, created things. All the dust, the dirt, the whole thing, anything we build is going to be shaken and destroyed. Why? So that new heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem, so that what cannot be shaken, your faith, your relationship with Christ, all those who have trusted Christ, who live for eternity, so that what cannot be shaken may remain, the new heavens and the new earth. And that's what he's talking about. It's like a slice of science fiction pie. It is absolute, every time I read this, I am amazed. But that's what God promises. And guess what? That's your future home. That's your future home. It's my future home. 